Why do we live in cities? And why do most cities worldwide continue to grow? We might not have a clear answer to these pressing questions as yet. But what is pretty clear is that cities are the engines of economic growth, innovation and wealth creation. And that to achieve this, cities actually need to connect us, the people. Cities bring together people with different skills and backgrounds, interests and cultures, which then sparks new ideas and trends and creates new jobs. In fact, empirical evidence shows that not only wealth indicators like per capita GDP tend to increase with city population size. We have found that human interactions accelerate at almost exactly the same pace. In other words, the interactions between the people are key for the social and economic functioning of cities. This fundamental role of human interactions is thus absolutely crucial for urban planners who are responsible for the design of public spaces and infrastructures that should facilitate the connectivity between the people. In the past, urban planning has indeed often been quite successful, leading to attractive public spaces that are now frequented by many people from all walks of life. But unfortunately, there are also numerous cases where urban planning interventions didn't lead to the desired outcomes, as is manifested in empty and sterile plazas, traffic jams or even social segregation. What makes it then so hard to design well-functioning cities? Well, one of the reasons is that in the past we didn't sufficiently understand how people actually make use of urban space. Let's just have a look at Manhattan in New York. We see people coming and going. We see taxi drivers going there for work. We see New Yorkers who might go there for shopping. Or we see tourists who might go there just once in a lifetime from very far away. There is a myriad of different interests and preferences that bring people here. And the result looks pretty random and chaotic, right? Unfortunately, it is exactly such seemingly chaotic patterns that urban planners need to deal with when trying to avoid potential planning pitfalls. But what if I told you that these movements we just saw are not at all random or chaotic, but that they are surprisingly structured and predictable, and that they follow hidden regularities that provide powerful guidelines for urban planning? Imagine you're standing on a public plaza which is full of people coming and going. Now imagine you ask all these people from how far away they are actually coming from. This is exactly what my collaborators and I did for Boston in the US. Except that we didn't need to stand on a plaza for several days. Instead we could analyze millions of anonymized mobile phone location data that have been provided to us for scientific purposes and in an aggregate form so as to ensure data privacy. So here is the result of our simple poll for Newbury Street, a famous shopping area in Boston. On the horizontal axis we have from how far people visited Newbury Street and on the vertical axis we have the number of visitors. Just to be precise, each data point is the number of visitors coming from a one square kilometer area at a given distance away. And what we see is that if we go further away from Newbury Street, we have less people coming. This is of course nothing really surprising, right? Who wants to travel all through the city just to do the groceries? However, our data now allow us to go one step further and to also ask how often people are actually coming. Here our same result, except that we now distinguish between how often each person visits Newbury Street. Red is the number of people coming about once per month, green is the number of people coming about four times a month, and yellow is the number of people coming about ten times a month. And what we see is that the number of visitors also decreases the more often they are coming. So we already start to see some very systematic patterns in this seemingly chaotic movement of people, right? But now comes the really surprising part. All these patterns can actually be predicted by a simple but powerful mathematical travel law. 
all that really matters is to just multiply the distance with the number of visits. For instance, the number of people coming once per month from 20 kilometers, which is the red square here, is about the same as the number of people coming about four times from five kilometers, which is the green square here. And it is also about the same as the number of people visiting ten times from two kilometers. Since if we multiply distance with the number of visits, we always get 20. So, in our simple poll, we can simply multiply distance with the number of visits and all our data points beautifully line up. Let me put it this way, if I spend just one day measuring how many people come to Newbury Street, I immediately know how many people will come over the next weeks from one, two or ten kilometers away and how many of them will visit once, twice or ten times a month. And you know what the best part is? This law, travel law isn't valid only for Newbury Street. It applies to virtually all locations in the Greater Boston area. Actually, let me rephrase even this. It happens all across the world. We looked into more data and found that the very same travel law holds for cities in Europe, Africa and Asia, regardless of the detailed geographies, cultures or levels of development. This travel law is pretty amazing, isn't it? But how can it now help urban planners to design great public spaces? Well, first of all, having an idea of how far and how often people are willing to travel helps to spot the best locations to put the new public space, such as a park. And to have an estimate of how many people such a new park can potentially attract. Second, infrastructure planning. Predictions of the population flows, especially to new urban developments, is essential for the planning of public transport and also for other infrastructures. We are actually applying exactly this idea now to support the electrification process in a developing country. And third, if we look at existing places and if we compare the actual number of visitors to our predictions, we can immediately identify those locations that attract less people than we would actually expect. This signals a clear need to make such a space more accessible or inviting for additional population groups. This travel law is just one example of how a more science-based approach to cities can help urban planning. We are actually just at the very beginning of revealing many more of such exciting and powerful regularities of how humans connect to each other in urban space. Cities are very complex. There will always be uncertainties in doing such predictions for urban planning. Think of Bushwick, Brooklyn in New York. Neighborhoods that suddenly become hip and trendy, leading to escalating housing prices. It is just very hard to predict such dynamics. Therefore, it is not sufficient to understand the basic laws of cities, such as the one I just showed. We additionally need to have early warning indicators that alert us of negative developments, such as social segregation. Science-based approaches can certainly help us here as well. And I'm pretty confident that we will soon be able to gain a much better understanding of how to build and maintain cities that truly enable many diverse human interactions. Thank you.